This morning we're going to be talking primarily about the gambling and the wagering industry, and uh, we're going to be looking at principles that the, the Christian must use when examining that. Uh, the title of this, when we put it in the, the bulletin and the announcements, was wagering or gambling and gaming. Uh, the emphasis is not going to be on gaming. It's going to be more on gambling and wagering and betting and things like that. Um, so just to be clear up front what it is that we're going to be talking about this morning. The past couple of years have seen an explosion in the gambling and the wagering industry. And the number of arenas in which it's possible to participate uh, has increased from what was already very widespread to something that is just at an entirely different level altogether. And uh, in the past, you had to at least extend some effort to become involved in, in wagering or gambling or betting or something like that. You had to at least put out some effort to participate. Uh, today, the wagering opportunities are almost seeking you out. You can't turn on an NFL or an NBA game without being confronted with the opportunities. You can't uh, visit your favorite website where you used to go just to check the box scores and the scoring and things like that uh, without finding links to gambling opportunities and wagering opportunities. Um, so what we need to look at here is to think about how the Christian should think about all of this. Um, are some of these opportunities more sinful than others? What about fantasy leagues? What if no money is involved? Is this an area of freedom? How should I respond if I'm invited to participate in a pool or some sort of wager? These are all really good questions. And what the Christian needs is he needs some kind of framework to think about all of these things. So we're going to spend the next two Sunday mornings trying to help with that framework. We're going to spend most of our time this week looking at what Scripture says about a few different areas of the Christian inter uh, life that intersect with the, the wagering industry. And these areas are stewardship, contentment, and worship. Because if we can think biblically about uh, the resources that God has entrusted to our care, and if we can think biblically about uh, what brings true contentment, and if we can think biblically about what it means to have a mindset of worship, then we have some tools that we can use to engage with these, these subjects that we have before us. So first, we're going to look at the Christian and his stewardship. And when we begin to think about stewardship, one of the first things we need to do is have a proper understanding of ownership. And that's because a steward is somebody who manages what belongs to somebody else. A steward certainly has things of their own, but... When he's acting in his role of steward, he's managing something that belongs to somebody else. And when we think about ownership, we need to start with creation itself, and we're going to look at things that, that are very well known to us, but it's a really important place to start. So we're going to start with the fact that all creation belongs to God. So we go to Genesis 1, and we remember that Genesis 1 tells us that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. God created all things, and nothing that exists wasn't brought here by God's creative power. And we know that Jesus himself was the active agent in making that happen, speaking all things into existence through the power of his word. John 1 tells us in verse 3 that all things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. And scripture teaches that there is a direct relationship between the creation of something and the ownership of that same thing. A passage that's very familiar to us is Isaiah 66. And when we think about that passage, we normally think about the back end of that passage and the kind of person that God looks to, that God looks to the man who is humble and he's contrite in heart and he trembles at God's word. Uh, today, we're going to look at the beginning part of that passage. If you have your Bibles, turn to Isaiah 66. This is a passage that helps us understand more about why it is that God is the owner of all things. God tells us, thus says Yahweh, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Where then is a house you could build for me and where is a place that I may rest? For my hand made all these things. Thus all these things came into being, declares Yahweh. So the earth is God's footstool. It belongs to him. It's God's. And God tells us the reason why it's his footstool. It's because he created it. At the beginning of verse 2, we see, my hand made all these things. Again, this is pretty intuitive to us. Uh, everything belongs to God because he created it. 
And as we think about something like wagering, it's important for us to look at the resources that are being put on the line in that wager and to recognize where the ownership of those things truly lies. That's important for us to do. So whether we're talking about chips that are put down at a card table, money that's being placed on a horse or on a team or on a player's scoring in that team, or some other form of collateral that's put forward to facilitate some bet, uh, all of these things represent a resource, a resource of some kind, and it's a resource that belongs to God. Every single one of them belongs to him. We're going to spend a fair amount of time in Psalms today, so if you have your Bibles again, we'll turn to Psalm 89. We're going to look at something that's, that's very significant there. Psalm 89, verse 11, tells us, again, much the same thing. The heavens are yours, the earth is yours, the world and all it contains, you have founded them. Notice here what belongs to God, the world and all it contains. It's not just the things that are mentioned specifically in creation account in Genesis 1 and 2, but all things that came forth from creation belong to God. David tells us in Psalm 24, the earth is Yahweh's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. What I want us to see here is the consistency of Scripture. Isaiah wrote 400 or more years after David did, and they're saying the same thing, that the earth belongs to the Lord because he created it. So we know that because God created all things, Scripture is clear that, that all things belong to God. That's very important when we consider wagering, because everything that is being wagered, the resource and everything that's being involved, it belongs to God. And the next we're going to look at the fact that man stewards what God has entrusted to him. This is important for us to understand the idea of stewardship. We're going to think about that quite a bit this morning. We're going to begin looking at God's design for stewardship, and we start by looking at his wisdom in his creation. So we're in Psalms, go to Psalm 104. We're going to look at verse 24. This speaks of God's wisdom in his creation, wisdom in the resources that he creates. Psalm 104, 24. O Lord, how many are your works. In wisdom you have made them all. God's creations are many. They are many. And his creation puts his wisdom on display. If you're ever someplace at night, you're a place where there's no light pollution, you look up into the stars and you see a vast number of stars before you. Stars you can't even begin to count if you look just a small sliver of the sky. And uh, it's a rare opportunity, but if you've ever had the chance to see the Milky Way itself, it is astounding. Uh, you go to someplace where there's no light pollution and you can see this, this band of light. And it's a hazy band of light. It looks like this, this small Milky Way. But in reality, it's somewhere between 100 and 400 billion stars. And every single one of those 400 billion stars has a unique mass and a unique position, a unique velocity, a unique composition, a unique atmospheric pressure. It's astounding to think about the wisdom that's required to bring all of those things into being and to hold them um, in perfect uniformity in creation. But God's wisdom is on display not only in the vastness of his creation, but also in the way in which how he causes all things to work together in his creation for his purpose. And this is where stewardship begins to come into view. And we need to understand that stewardship has been part of God's design for creation and for man from the very, very beginning. So let's turn to the first pages of our Bible. We're going to see Genesis chapter 2. We're going to see God's design for stewardship for man. And we're going to look at the second account of creation first. And then we're going to go back to the first account. And again, the second account of creation uh, speaks at more of a high-level view of what is taking place. The first account is more of a blow-by-blow, -blow, boots on the ground, what happens every day. Genesis chapter 2, verse 8, Yahweh God planted a garden toward the east in Eden, and there he placed the man whom he had formed. I'm going to drop down to verse 15. So God has a garden, he places man in it. And in verse 15, we're going to see the reason why God put man in that garden. Then Yahweh God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to cultivate it, 
and keep it. Man's task was to cultivate and keep the garden. He was to be a steward of God's garden. And it's important for us to see that this is before the fall. Before there was any sin, before there was anybody else to observe Adam doing this, Adam was to care for the garden. He was to glorify God by exercising his stewardship over that which God created. So scripture is clear from the beginning that God has given man stewardship of what he's created. We also want to look and see how man's stewardship displays God's image. And we're going to talk about stewardship on a large scale, a general sense here. And in just a bit, we'll take this to a more personal level, but it's good for us to look at things uh, at a large scale first and see how God puts man in place that man can display God's image through stewarding what he created. So we'll go back to Genesis chapter 1. We're going to look at verses 28 and 30. This is where God talks about creating man in his image. And it's astounding to see what God does with this. In verse 26, God says, this is the triune God speaking. This is Elohim. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So we know that man is created in God's image. He tells us that here. And this is a very, very exalted position compared to the rest of God's creation. No other part of God's creation has the privilege and has the task of bearing God's image. And in bearing God's image, man has the privilege of respect, reflecting God's character to the world around him. But notice the connection between bearing God's image and stewardship and rule over God's creation the first thing God thinks about when he thinks about bearing his image is dominion and his rule. Let us make man in our image and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and everything else. God's design was for man to bear his image by exercising dominion and oversight over all that God made. So if we think back to our definition of stewardship, where stewardship is the one who manages what belongs to somebody else, Managing something is very similar to ruling over something. Like a manager of a team, uh, he dictates or he rules over the, the function of the team as they're playing their games. So man puts God's image on display by exercising stewardship over the rest of God's creation. And God didn't just leave man to accomplish this task by his own means. It's important for us to understand that God equipped man for that task. So we drop down to verse 28. God blessed them. And God said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So God blessed Adam and Eve and he gave them a unique equipping. And that was how he blessed them, was with a unique equipping. And that equipping was essential not only to fill the earth, but to subdue it. God blessed the man with the intellect and the powers of reason that he would need to exercise his dominion over the rest of creation. He simply could not subdue creation without having the means that God would give him to do that. So God was good and he did that. So what we can see is central to the idea of bearing God's image is a proper use of the equipping that God has given us to bear that image. And we use that equipping to put his wisdom on display through our oversight of the resources that he's given to us. God is saying to man, use the equipping that I have given to you to put my image on display and do that by exercising good oversight of all the things that I've created. So all of this relates to general stewardship of the things God has created, and we definitely want to affirm that. We need to be people who are good stewards on a large scale of what God has given to us. But as we think about how this applies to something like the gambling industry or the wagering industry, we need to move away from the idea of stewardship in a large sense, and we move to something that is much more specific, something that is much more individualized, and look at what Scripture says about stewardship of what God has specifically entrusted to each one of us. And to do that, we need to think about work. We're going to talk about work for quite a bit this morning. So we're going to look at man's stewardship of his work and his stewardship of his work for his provision and when we talk about stewardship of what God has entrusted to our care, we need to look about the relationship between work and provision. 
There was one relationship between work and provision before the fall, and there's another relationship after the fall. So we're going to go to verse 29 of Genesis 1 and look at the relationship that's in place before the fall. God said, Behold, I've given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of the earth, and every tree that has fruit yielding seed, and it shall be food for you. So God's provision is on full display here. I've given you every plant, and it shall be food for you. Uh, In his wisdom, God created man in his unfallen condition with a need for food. God made provision for that on day three, and it was there, the provision was there before man was on day six. And you see that back in verse 11. God says, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees on the earth bearing fruit after their kind with seeds in them. So God has the provision all set up to go before he has man there, and he brings man into the picture. So you have the provision, and you have the food, and then you also have the work, the work that you see in Genesis 2, verse 15, that we read earlier. God had Adam working. He was cultivating the garden. He was keeping the garden. He was caring for it. So there was work before the fall, and there was a provision before the fall. They were both in effect. They were both there. Adam's task before the fall was to cultivate and keep the garden that God had made. And that was the relationship. They were both present, but one was not dependent upon the other. But then you have the fall, and this is where you see the dependency. And here is where the relationship between provision and work comes into view. We know the fall, the serpent appears and he speaks with Eve and then Adam is right there and they eat from the the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that God had commanded them not to eat from. And then God has a, a level of curses. He has three curses. He has one for the woman, he has one for the man, and he has one for the serpent. What we're going to look at this morning is God's curse on the man. We're going to look at verse 17 through 19 of Genesis 3. This is going to be really helpful for us as we see the relationship between between provision and work. God writes, uh, Moses writes, divinely inspired, cursed is the ground because of you. This is God speaking to Adam. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life, both the thorns and the thistles it shall grow for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread till you return to the ground. So we know this. Uh, Adam's sin brought a curse onto the earth. And the result of this sin was that Adam was still permitted to eat. But that eating will come with toil, labor, hard labor, all the days of his life until he returns to the ground. Notice here that God didn't create work to be a one and done experience for us. It is in place all the days of his life. And the work will be hard, it will be lifelong, and we all know what that is. We feel the the effect of that today. So we need to ask ourselves, why are we looking at this? We're looking at this because the provision that comes uh, with that provision comes the need to manage that provision and steward that provision. God's provision reaches into many areas of of our lives. His provision for us allows us to purchase food. It allows us to provide shelter, transportation, health care for ourselves. So we need to use the equipping that God has given to us Um, to allocate the portions of God's provision for our different needs. And we need the wisdom for that. We need to be a steward of those resources because the provision that God gives us has to be allocated to all the different areas of our lives that God has given to us. And on many occasions, uh, God's provision comes to us more or less frequently than every day. It comes every two weeks or once a month or every week or whatever that is. That portion comes in in larger portions than just what's necessary for one day. So we have to have the wisdom to steward that across a period of time. And that's another needs a way that we need to exercise stewardship. And God's design is that man would find joy in his work. Now, joy doesn't come from the work itself, but the joy comes from participating in God's design for us, for our provision. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 24 and 25 There is nothing better for man than to eat and drink and tell himself that his labor is good. This also all I've seen from that is in the hand of God. For who can eat and who can have enjoyment without him? In the middle of verse 24 here, Solomon writes in Ecclesiastes that man's labor is good and it is from the hand of God. Man can derive joy from his work because despite the fact that we have ruined creation with our sin, 
and that we've brought a curse into this world because of our sin, God has given us a means of provision through earnest hard work. So our first takeaway about work is that work is God's means of provision to us in this fallen world. It's a gracious means of provision to us in this fallen world. And we need to exercise stewardship over that provision to meet his various needs. So work is the basis for our provision, but it's the basis of three other things that we're going to talk about today. And one of those things we're going to talk about is our giving. Work is the basis for our giving. And God has ordained that we set aside some of the fruits of our labor to support the ministry of the gospel and to meet the needs of those who have less than ourselves. And one place we can see that is in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. If you want to get a pretty good theology of giving, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9, also the beginning of 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Here Paul is writing to the church in Corinth. This is his second canonized letter to the church in Corinth. And what he's doing here is he's describing to the people in Corinth who are very wealthy the demeanor of those who are in Macedonia. And he's describing their demeanor as it relates to a collection that was being made to assist the poor church in Jerusalem. So again, Paul's writing to those in Corinth about the demeanor of those in Macedonia as it relates to collecting gifts for those in Jerusalem. So chapter 8, verses 1 through 3, Paul writes, Now, brethren... We wish to make known to you the grace of God which has been given in the churches of Macedonia, that in a great ordeal of affliction, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord. So we see here that God has a design for how it is that that believers are to give. They're to give joyfully in verse 2. In verse 3, near the front of the verse, they're to give according to their ability. Later on in the verse, they're to give of their own accord. Uh, 2 Corinthians 9 says some of the same things. Give of our own volition, to give without compulsion by anybody else. When we go to the book of 3 John, we see how it is that believers are to participate in the specific needs of advancing the gospel. So let's turn to 3 John. We're going to look at verses 5 and 8 together. And again here, this relates to the stewardship of what we have. And John is writing to Gaius, and he's explaining how it is that uh, they are to assist those who are missionaries, those who are itinerant missionaries. And he's writing to a group of people who have been very faithful. And so John writes, Beloved, you are acting faithfully in whatever you accomplish for the brethren, especially when they are strangers. And they have testified to your love before the church, and you will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God, For they went out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support such men so that we may be fellow workers with the truth. So John is acknowledging that the group of people that that are around Gaius have accomplished things for the brethren. And he encourages Gaius to send those people on their way and to support such men. Again, these are itinerant missionaries, missionaries who are traveling with the gospel. And he's saying send them on their way and support them. Don't send them empty-handed, send them with your support and your encouragement and your provision. So scripture is very clear that we're to give. We're to give to those who are accomplishing ministry purposes for the gospel, but we're also to give to those who are in need. Uh, James chapter two is a really good passage that addresses that. Verses 15 and 16, James writes, if a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, And one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body. What use is that? What we see here is is God's design in, in brotherly kindness and brotherly giving to one another, that we give what is necessary to a brother or to a sister who who is lacking in an area of need. So another part of God's design for work is that we steward the fruits of our labor to set funds aside so that we can participate in the ministry of the gospel and we can participate in providing assistance to those who are in need. So again, we see that that man has to exercise stewardship over what God has entrusted to him so that he can use this for the needs of the church. And this is going to relate to wagering and gambling and we'll get there in, in a bit. But God is also described that man exercised stewardship of his provision for his saving. 
So scripture also speaks to the quality of a man who chooses a lifestyle that leaves him with an ongoing surplus in his budget. And scripture speaks really highly of this man. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 25. There is precious treasure and oil in the dwelling of the wise, but a foolish man swallows it up. So this oil that's being described as precious treasure is reserve. It's, it, it's a surplus. It's an abundance. It's something that a man is setting aside. He doesn't spend everything he has, and it's a precious treasure. He's saved for the future, for an unexpected event, or for the need of somebody else that might arise. And speech, Scripture speaks very highly of this man. It describes him as wise. When we go to the New Testament, we see in Ephesians chapter 4 that God has a purpose in work for us. Verse 28 is really, really helpful for young men. It's helpful for all of us, but particularly for young men to have a right idea of what it means to work. We see here in verse 28, he who steals must steal no longer. So the first thing is don't steal. But rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good. So secondly, after not stealing, work, labor, work with your hands. And at the end of the verse, we see the reason why. The reason why is so that he will have something to share with the one who has need. Man is to work for a purpose much greater than simply to meet his own needs. He's to work to provide beyond his own needs. And the reason for that we see is that at the very end, so that we can share with those who are in need. We work for the purpose of meeting our own needs, but beyond that, to meet the needs of others who have needs. And then scripture speaks to the issue of an inheritance as well. Go back to Proverbs. We're going to look at Proverbs 13. Proverbs 13 describes the kind of man who leaves an inheritance for those who come after him and his family. Proverbs 13, 22. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. So a good man leaves something to his family that comes after him. So a man will have something to share, and he will have something to leave as an inheritance for others if he's been saving out of what the Lord has given to him as provision. And we know this, but it's good for us to think about this. And this is what it means to be biblically minded as it relates to stewardship. And finally, we're going to talk about man's provision and his work for his rest and his leisure. Each of the above passages instruct giving resources for the advancement of several different things, for your own work, for the advancement of the gospel, for the family that comes after you. But what we're going to look at here is work that relates to leisure. Genesis 2.2 is our example of God's design for rest. By the seventh day, God completed his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all of his work, which he had done. So this is a pattern that God is putting before us. It's a pattern of work followed by rest. Work followed by rest. Work followed by rest. God didn't need to rest because he was tired. Instead, what he was doing was giving us a pattern. And in that pattern, we see that we have a, a right mindset that recognizing God in his work. And, and God helps us understand what this really is to look like when he speaks to the reason why they should have a Sabbath rest in Israel. We need to think differently about the Sabbath today than the Old Testament Israel did, but we see something in it that's very, very important for us. Deuteronomy chapter 5, as God is giving the law the second time, and he gives the Ten Commandments the second time, uh, God writes in verse 14 and 15, The seventh day is a Sabbath of Yahweh your God. In it you shall not do any work. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and Yahweh your God brought you out of there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, Yahweh your God commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. So God had two purposes for Israel on this Sabbath day. The first was that they would remember their slavery in Egypt. And secondly, they, they would remember that it's God who rescued them and took them out of that slavery in Egypt. And so the, the Sabbath rest is, is a reminder that God delivers from bondage. We read in our New Testament that Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 12, verse 8, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. And the meaning here is that any day of rest is to serve Christ. Whatever our activity is in our rest, we should joyfully submit to Christ's lordship of our life in that activity, on that rest. And by God's grace, most of us have some amount of surplus in our monthly budget. 
Some have a little more, some have a little less. We don't have to work every minute of every week. But all of it is from the Lord, and by his providence, we have uh, an abundance, and we are to use that well. But whatever surplus we have, the surplus comes from God, who graciously brings that abundance from the work he's given us to do. So we've learned some significant things about work, that work is a gracious means of meeting our needs in this fallen world. But this work is also the basis of our giving. This work is also the basis of our savings. This work is also the basis of our ability to enjoy some amount of leisure. And this is significant because it relates to wagering in that we, don't, we need to remember that in most cases, wagers are placed with money that we have earned, money that God has given to us as a result of our labor, money that God has given to us to steward for his glory. So if we're considering some sort of wager, we need to ask ourselves some question relating to God's purpose for his provision to us. And what we're going to do next time is spend most of our time looking at what those questions are and how these principles relate to that. So this morning, again, we're looking at principles examined, and then next week we're going to look at principles applied. So that's a number of things to consider about stewardship. But what we're going to look at next is contentment, uh, because contentment has an awful lot to do with wagering as well. And after we look at contentment, we're going to look at worship. But uh, we need to consider contentment because the person who is not content with their current situation is looking at what they have, and they're considering what God has provided for them, and they're considering it to be less than sufficient for them. And so the biblical contentment actually is rooted in, in two things. One of them is the sufficiency of Christ. And Paul addresses the issue of contentment in chapter 4 of his letter to the church in Philippi. And it's really, really helpful. Um, but the foundation that for the discussion about contentment has everything to do with the person of Christ himself. So we're going to look at Philippians 4, verses 4 and 5. And then be, after that, we're going to be looking at verses 12 and 13. 4 and 5 is going to help us understand some things about Christ that help us think rightly about contentment. So Paul writes in verses 4 and 5 of Philippians 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and petition, supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Let's look at what this passage tells us about Christ himself. In verse 4, we are to rejoice in Christ. In verse 5, we learn that the Lord Christ is near. And in verse 6, we, we learn that God guards our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. He puts peace in our hearts and our minds through Christ Jesus. So we're to find our sufficiency in Christ. When we think about all of our circumstances that are around us, what allows us to think rightly about them, what allows us to have joy, is the fact that uh, it's all rooted in the person of Christ because he is near and God brings peace to us in Christ. And this is important when we get to contentment and down in verses 12 and 13. Paul says, I know how to get along with humble means and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So Paul is talking about having learned the secret of being filled and going hungry. And again, this is not some mysterious secret that's hard to find. He spells it out for us in verses 4 and 5. He's found his sufficiency in Christ. He believes that whether his provision is a lot or it's a little... He is well, and he's well because his joy is in Christ, and the Lord is near to him, and the peace of God is guarding his heart in Christ. So when we think about contentment, we need to think about Christ first and foremost. Our contentment is not a function of the size of our provision, or provision that we don't have, provision that we would like to have. Our contentment is the fact that we have access to Christ. Christ is near so that's the first principle about contentment we want to understand. And the second principle we want to understand is that our, our contentment is rooted in our confidence in God's character itself. So we've mentioned this quite a bit recently at church, Psalm 119, verse 68. The psalmist writes, you are good and you do good, so teach me your statutes. So we know that God's character is to do good. God himself is the definition of what it is to be good. What he does will always, always be good. 
Everything that he brings to pass in our lives, everything that he brings to pass in everybody else's life is always good. And we know that. We know this. We can trust that whatever God has brought to pass in our life, in our personal situation, is good, and God's plan for us is good, and his sanctification of us through his control of those circumstances is also good. Paul writes in chapter 1 of Philippians, verse 6, I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. So Paul is talking about a positional sanctification here, but he's talking about a progressive ongoing sanctification as well. The good work that God began speaks to the work that God did at salvation, a positional sanctification putting us in Christ, and that was for our good. And then the perfecting that is going to be taking place until the day of Christ is the ongoing sanctification in our lives. And because God always does good, we can believe that whatever he chooses to do to bring about that sanctification is also good. So the way this relates to contentment is this. If I truly believe that God is working for my sanctification, then I need to see my current situation as the means God has chosen to bring about that sanctification. And we know that as well. We talk about that here in the service. We talk about that at small groups. We talk about that in conversations with one another. But anything less than that would be to doubt God's character. If we're discontent over our circumstance, specifically a provision that would seek us to run out after something else outside of the means of work, what we're really saying is that we believe that God is not working for our ultimate good. We believe that God is not actively perfecting the work that he did begin in us. And that God's work in us for something other than our good and our sanctification. So the author of Hebrews gives us a couple of real world examples of this, uh, this principle at work. So let's look at Hebrews chapter 13, verses 4 and 5. And again, this relates to God's character. Verse, 14, uh, verse 4 discusses marriage, and verse 5 talks about our character being free from the love of money. We're going to start in verse 5, but I'll read the passage altogether first. Marriage is to be held in honor among all, and the marriage bed is to be undefiled. For fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you, and I will never forsake you. So let's take a look at money in verse 5. The Christian is to be free from the love of money. Instead, we're to trust in God's good character and what compels him to allocate as he has chosen to allocate to us. When we love money, what we're loving more than anything else is something other than what God has chosen to provide us with. That is why we're to be free from the love of money. When we're free from the love of money, what we're saying is, I trust God, and I trust God's good character in his decision of what is right for me in terms of provision. The same thing is true back in verse 4. Now, the bottom line with the fornicator and the adulterer is that they're not content with what God has given to them. They're not content with their marriage. They're not content with their season of life that God has given to them. They're running for satisfaction outside of their marriage, or they're running to find satisfaction without getting married. They believe that God's assessment of what is best for them is not actually best for them. Instead, they put their trust in their own assessment of what is best for them, and they're wrong every single time. So the testimony of Scripture is that we're to find our contentment in the things that God has ordained to bring about our own sanctification. So when we think about wagering, we need to think about contentment there are some good questions to ask when it comes to that, and we'll look into some of those next week. And the last area we're going to look at is the Christian and worship. And this has been an area of focus for us as well in, in recent services. And we need to look at this carefully because uh, we need to think about what it is that we're to do with our time, how it is we're supposed to use our mind when we're going through the day that God has given to us. And one of the realities about wagering is that there is potential for significant financial loss when you're placing bets and wagers on the outcome of some future event or some game, a game, a player's performance, whatever, all of this can weigh very heavily on a man's mind. And that relates to where our worship really lies. And one of the things we need to understand is that we are all worshipers. God created us to be worshipers. God created Adam to worship him. God created all of us for the same reason. And we know what we worship by what we fill our mind with 
and what we allow to be the affections of our heart. I want to read a passage that describes what should increasingly be the pattern of the mind for the Christian. It's a pattern that a passage that I think we're all familiar with. It's Colossians chapter three. We're going to look at the verse four verses there. And what we're going to look at is the kinds of things that the believer should be setting their minds on. And we know this. Paul is writing to a group of people that are dear believers. And he says, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you will also be revealed with him in glory. This is really helpful. It's helpful for us to remember that the believers are to um, obey the instructions that are in this passage. In verse 1, we're to keep seeking the things that are above. We're to seek after those things. We're to set our mind on the things above. That means that those are the things that are to occupy our thought process. The things above are the things that Paul mentions in verses 1 and 2. And we see those spelled out for us in verses 3 and 4. The fact that your life is hidden with Christ in God. That's what it means to seek the things above. In verse 4, seeking the things above relates to Christians being in attendance with Christ when he uh, is here in his reign on this earth. When Christ is revealed, that's what it means to set your mind on the things above and to live your life with those things in mind. So the believer should be regularly considering their identity. And their identity is no longer in themselves alone here in this world. Instead, their identity is hidden in God. It has to do with who we are in an eternal sense and that one day we are coming back with Christ. So what I want to do is, is read three passages for us and these passages all have the same message, but what they do is they instruct us on how it is we're to be using our mind uh, before the Lord. And the first of those is Philippians 3. We're going to look at verses 20 and 21. This relates to our citizenship and where our citizenship is and the anticipation that we have because of that citizenship. Paul writes, <clears throat> Our citizenship is in heaven from which we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. So what we see there is the believer should be um, eagerly waiting for a Savior. And that waiting is, is not a passive waiting. It's a very active waiting. But we need to be thinking rightly about the fact that our existence one day will be that we, we exist in a body that's been transformed into another condition. A condition that's very simple, similar and very conforming to the body of Christ in his glorified condition. First Thessalonians, the end of chapter 1, helps us understand something that's very, very useful towards this end as well. And Paul is writing to the church in Thessalonica and it's telling, he's telling them about the report that was given to him by other believers in the Mediterranean area. So these are other people telling Paul about the people in Thessalonica after they came to Christ. So they themselves report about us, what kind of a reception we had with you and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. That is Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. Again, there's a waiting there, but you can tell that this is not a passive waiting. This is a very active waiting because it's a waiting where they're serving a living and true God. As we think about wagering and things like that, we think we need to ask ourselves questions about what it looks like to serve God with the life that God has given to us. Serve God with our mind, serve God with our time, serve God with our resources. Same letter, chapter 5. Paul is giving some summary instructions to the believers before he closes out his letter. And he says, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. This is what it means to worship. It means to rejoice, to be full of joy in every circumstances that God has, has brought to us. To pray in those circumstances, to consistently be a man or a woman who is bringing our issues and our circumstances before the Lord in prayer. 
We need wisdom. We need assistance. We need help. We need encouragement. We're to do that through prayer. We're to be thankful, knowing that God is working for our sanctification and our good in all of those situations. This is what God's will is for us, for the believer. And as it relates to gambling and wagering, we need to ask ourselves things. Is this something that we can rejoice in? Is this something we pray over? Is this something we give thanks for? So there are principles there, and we'll investigate those more next time. And the last passage I want to leave with us this morning is 2 Peter chapter 3. We're going to look at verses 11 to 13. And again, Peter is writing to his audience, and he's writing, and he's, he's talking about the, the end of the age that is coming. And he's talking about what is going to take place on this earth and what kind of people we should be. Starting in verse 11 of 2 Peter 3. Since all these things, this earth, are going to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. We see in verse 12 exactly what it is that the believer is to do with their life here. They are to look for and hasten the coming of the day of the Lord. And what that means for us is to be faithful in the life that God has given to us. It doesn't mean we sit here and idly wait for uh, the Lord's return. What it means is we are actively doing the things that God has given to us to care well for our own heart and advance the gospel in our own homes, in our workplace, in our relationships, on the mission field, wherever else it is we are. That's the kind of people we should be, knowing that this world is going to end. Paul is, or Peter is talking about the destruction of this world to help us see how fruitless it is to put our joy and our contentment in the things that are here today. So we've looked at the idea of stewardship, and we've looked at the idea of contentment, we've looked at the idea of worship. And next time, what we're going to do is we're going to be applying those things to some of the issues of wagering and gambling and all of those things. So we haven't really spoken about all of those issues very much this morning, but what I hope we've done is, is put in place some good principles that we can use when we begin to discuss those things. So I'm looking forward to that time next week. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you again for your word. I thank you, Lord, that your, your word is abundant to us. Lord, your word is a, a very comprehensive, very thick revelation of yourself to us. And Lord, you've given us everything we need for life and godliness in that. Lord, I pray for each one of us that we would think carefully about the stewardship of what it is that you've entrusted to us. We would think very carefully about where we find our contentment, where we find our joy. We would think very carefully about what it means to worship you in the life that you've given to us. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be thinking well about those things, uh, Lord, so that we can be pleasing and honoring to you. Thank you again for these dear friends, Lord, that are here this morning. I pray your blessing on them, not only here in this service, but in this week. And I pray it in Christ's name. Amen.